second speaker is Jeff Morrison. And uh, Jeff is probably new to, I think, everybody in the room. He's the executive director of the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association. Uh, before, new, before joining the CHRA in early 2016, he was the director of government relations and public affairs for the Canadian Pharmacists Association. He has a master's of arts in sciences politiques and again from the University of Ottawa. And he's very active here in town where he sits on the board of directors of Operation Come Home and Bruce House and he chairs the organizing committee for the Ottawa Pride Month. Jeff. <coughs> Uh, well, thank you, Jeff, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know it's always customary when you, you uh, start off a presentation to say, you know, it's a real pleasure to be here, and that's whether you actually mean it or not. Um, but i got to tell you, it really is a pleasure to be here at CUDA, uh, because I've had a bit of a history with CUDA in some prior roles. Um, one of the uh, uh, previous roles that, that Jeff didn't mention was from about 2000 to 2008, I worked for the Canadian Construction Association, and I looked after their infrastructure file. And so I worked really closely with folks like Mike Roshelo, uh from TAC, Sarah Wells, et cetera. So um, it's really, it's a little bit like homecoming to see some of the folks. Uh, it also makes me feel incredibly old. Um, but regardless, it's, uh, it really is a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, I was also really, really pleased uh, this morning, and Patrick, I think it was yourself that mentioned that uh, CUDA isn't just about building mass transit. You're all about building sustainable communities. And that is something that our two organizations very much have in common. Um, even though, and I'll explain about what CHR is in, is in a moment, uh, a lot of people say Canadian Housing and Renewal Association. Like, what's, what's that about? What's renewal? And of course, that's really our intent to renew communities. Uh, obviously, from more of a housing perspective, but housing, of course, does not exist uh, in a vacuum. It works very much with the systems around it, and mass transit and public transit are, are fundamental. So just to explain very quickly about who we in fact are, this is just a very simple diagram uh, demonstrating the housing spectrum. Um, this is something we all have in common. We're all somewhere on the housing spectrum. Uh, many of us, of course, are in the market side of things. But the reality is, for many Canadians, particularly low-income and vulnerable populations, uh, they rely on, on what we call non-market housing, social housing, non-profit housing, public housing, uh, sadly, 235,000 Canadians uh, don't have a home at any given point in the year and therefore rely on shelters. Uh, so as an organization, we represent sort of the left side of, of this diagram. Are, are those housing providers, municipalities, etc., that provide uh, what we term non-market housing. Um, so this is, of course, a CUTA conference. So one of the first things we wanted to talk about was, okay, where does social housing and uh, urban transit fit together. And I think this is pretty much a no-brainer statement that there needs to be strong complementarity between affordable housing and, and public transit. Um, and one of the key reasons for that is frankly we both serve the same clientele. We both serve the same populations. Uh, as you see on the table, and I believe this was actually a cue to chart, um, although of course mass transit is not solely for uh, low income, the reality is that many of your clients are from those lower uh, income quartiles. That's the same population that we serve. Uh, social and affordable housing by its very nature uh, is intended for lower income populations. And so it just kind of makes sense that if you're both serving uh, similar populations and similar clients, you want to be co-located, you want to be together, you want to be complementing each other. And that doesn't involve just uh, land use, it doesn't involve just planning, it very much and should very much also include funding decisions. Now, that should be, I would imagine, as I say, a no-brainer statement. And I'm pretty sure I don't have to convince anyone in this room of those realities. Um, but the reality is, we're still not there. Just last week, as an example, quick story, I was meeting with the head of, let's just say, a large Canadian housing uh, provider, municipal housing provider. Uh, they had, on their books, a development that they were pretty much ready to go, you know, that kind of shovel-ready type project, would have created a couple hundred affordable housing units uh, in that city. Uh, and best of all, the location of it was such that it was essentially over top uh, a, subway, a subway stop, and that there was a bus route that kind of, you know, went into the middle of, of the, 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 the proposed development. Um, problem is, they could get no money to actually do the development. Uh, they had applied through a, a new program, uh, an innovation program that CMHC runs. Um, government turned them down, said not innovative enough. Uh, 
So even though what we think should be a no-brainer type, uh, type observation that social housing and mass transit need to link together, our politicians and our, public de and our decision makers still aren't there. But it is a message I want to leave here with you, is that as you pursue transit-oriented development, oriented development, as you pursue your decision in terms of where and how to locate uh, transit, please take into consideration that importance of social and affordable housing, because again, that's where our folks live. Um, I just want to diverge for a second just to focus a little bit on the housing side, because you know there's that old saying that, that crisis brings opportunity, you know, crisis tunity, I think I've heard the term. Um, there are some challenges that social nonprofit and, and, and affordable housing are facing in Canada, but we're also at a point, and I think, you know, and this is an overused term, but I think we're actually at a crossroads, whereby the future of social housing is very much being shaped over the next few months, and I think there's a real opportunity here for housing, affordable housing, and uh, and mass transit systems to really become much more integrated and complementary. But to show why that is the case, I just need to first. I uh, give a quick snapshot about some of those challenges facing affordable housing. Um, if you talk to providers, to the CEOs of affordable housing units, you ask them what's keeping you awake at night. Most of them will say this thing called uh, EOA, expiry of operating agreements. Very, very quickly, operating agreements were essentially <coughs> tools that predominantly the federal government used from about the 1950s, 60s, 70s, up until about 1993, whereby CMHC and the federal government would essentially enter one-on-one -on -one operating agreements with nonprofit and social housing providers that would essentially subsidize the cost of the mortgage for the property and would subsidize the rents. That's how providers have been able to provide uh, below market rents for those tenants. Um, Right now, there's about 600,000 units that are under operating agreements. The provincial, the federal government devolved uh, a number of these agreements to the provinces, but still, the, the principle is the same. The problem is, these agreements were made for a long period of time, 30, 40, 50 years. They're all somewhat different. Um, catch is, they're now starting to expire. And although I don't have the chart on, uh, on this presentation, if you saw kind of the decline, you would note that right about now, 2015, 16, 17, the drop really begins to precipitate. Um, and so the question is, okay, so then how do these providers continue to maintain uh, affordable non below market rents? That's the question. Um, I mentioned affordable, excuse me, that operating agreements had ended in about 93. If they had continued on at roughly the same pace they had over the past few decades, we would have had about 100,000 more affordable housing units in Canada than we currently do. So that's that becomes a supply problem. As I mentioned earlier, about 235,000 Canadians simply don't have a place to live, uh, who experience homelessness at some point during the year, and that's a chief concern. Uh, over a quarter of renters in Canada, so people that are in uh, rental accommodation, um, over a quarter are in what we call deep housing, core housing need, which means that they're spending over 30% of their income on housing. Um, we're having a major supply uh, constraint problem in places like, and you've heard this I'm sure in the media, Toronto, Vancouver in particular, but increasingly we're seeing other cities who are facing uh, rental, ha rental supply problems. Um, a recent study that came out about a year ago suggested that the capital needs, so in other words the cost to fix and repair the existing units that we already have is somewhere in that neighborhood of 8 to 13 billion per year. Uh, and that we need at least a 10-year program to catch up with the deferred maintenance that's occurred. It's funny, I'm just looking out, you know, in the window here, and actually, because I, I just happen to live, like if you drew a straight line, I live about four blocks that way. Um, so I kind of know the, the, the housing neighborhood here, here. And I can see, actually, some social housing units just off in the distance, and, and I know, because I've been in them, um, that the capital needs, the repair needs are quite significant. And this is across Canada. Um, and then, of course, if you all heard, as you've all heard in the media, Housing inflation uh, has just gone uh, through the roof, again, particularly in Toronto, Vancouver, which has uh, inflated the rest of the country's numbers. Uh, so that puts additional pressures on social housing units because people can't move through the spectrum. They're kind of stuck. Um, now, in the midst of all this, our organization, just like CUDA, we've been lobbying the federal government quite significantly, in particular with the election of Mr. Trudeau, to do something about these challenges. And to their credit, they have, been take, they have taken housing as a priority. Uh, in the 2016 budget, there was an immediate infusion of 3.2 billion over a two-year period to kind of serve as a, as a band-aid to help address some immediate concerns. But for us, the real uh, big budget was a few months ago in 2017 when the federal government introduced uh, over 11.2 billion in new investments for social 
and affordable housing. That's actually a low number as well, because in addition, what they announced was that money that would essentially just disappear when operating agreements were set to expire, and as I said, the, the, the decline is quite precipitous over the next few years, um, that they would maintain that money within the system. The catch is you don't know how yet, and, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so as you can see here, I won't go through this all, but this is kind of a breakdown of how they're spending that 11 billion. Uh, Three billion is being given to the provinces. Uh, Two billion being spent on uh, fixing homelessness. Uh, there's some money for federal lands to make federal land available at no charge to municipalities or providers to build uh, northern housing, something we had argued for, housing research. Um, and then this five billion kind of big pot of money, for what they call a the national housing fund. And I just want to come back to some of these because now I'm sort of whoops, now I'm sort of drawing the link back to between where can some of the opportunities between housing and transit exist. Well, with new money on the table, of course, that always creates new kinds of opportunities. So what could we see? Well, with that $5 billion national housing fund, the feds have been very clear. That there's some ways that they want to see that spent. Um, by the way, I'll point out that although this was contained in the budget, we won't really have a better sense of what this is all going to look like until about November. Uh, in November, our key minister, Minister Duclos, will be unveiling a national housing strategy. And this will kind of flesh out how these things will be, uh, will be spent. But what we think in that five billion, that they're talking about a co-investment fund for large-scale projects. So just like that program I described in Montreal, that large development where there's some mass transit uh, factored in, that could potentially, uh, the bells should be ringing saying there's opportunity there to link up with, uh, with transit. And then a question, and you know, hopefully we'll have a chance to meet Mr. Sohi uh, again, but one thing we've been asking his office is, is the new infrastructure bank, will housing developments uh, be considered an eligible project? And we haven't gotten a clear answer on that yet. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago, his office essentially said, we're not sure, uh, but maybe. So that's something I think maybe we can, we can really push together. Um, so really, this key question with all this new money on the table, and especially for the new money that you're also getting, I think it's what, 20 billion that you got in the last budget, uh, is, is how do we link these two? How do we really integrate and complement these funding uh, opportunities that are gonna come down the road so that housing and transit can really coexist. So just really quickly, what we expect to be in the next few months, in November, the national housing strategy that will kind of flesh out how all those uh, programs will be spent will be unveiled. The start button for many of them will be on April 2018. Um, one thing I didn't mention is everything I've talked about is kind of housing writ large, but if you ever were to focus in on something called the, the, the indigenous strategy piece of it, um, indigenous housing is, is facing a lot more challenges. So we know that there's an indigenous strategy being developed, we just don't know when. It's, we're being told it will be delayed somewhat. Um, and then the feds have essentially said, look, we're not gonna get all this right. We want to sort of develop these programs, uh, modify them, uh, change them as, as, uh, as, as, as is warranted. So again, I think if, if CUDA and CHRA continue to look at ways to improve some of these programs, that can only help us both.